As Jacob said, uh, I am so happy to be here. Uh, this is my fourth NDC event. I did NDC Sydney virtually with my wife, uh, and that was for Aus yeah for yeah Sydney. And then I did NDC Oslo twice, and I did NDC Porto. So I've done some of the. I'm going to try to do the the total run of of, of all the locations if possible, because uh, NDC is a great conference. Um, how many of you? This is your very first tech conference ever. Raise your hand. I ever. That's amazing. Well, you started really, really high because NDC does tech events at a very high level. And so you are in for a treat. How many of you have been to, let's say, two or more NDC locations? All right. Keep your hands up uh, if it's true. How about three or more? Four or more? Okay. So the person in the back, you've been to all of them? Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't know, NDC has these conferences all around the world. Of course, their home, their, their home quarters, uh, their home base is in Oslo. If you have not been to Oslo, I highly recommend it. It is a very beautiful city, uh, and it's an amazing place to visit. So I hope that you are enjoying the kickoff of this conference. Um, I'm really excited about having a conference with so many workshops, so many opportunities to grow your skills. So uh, if you have not signed up for a workshop, hopefully you can do that very quickly because uh, there's lots of content that is queued up for uh, NDC Minnesota. Now, this talk is about trust. And one key thing that I want everyone who is listening to me now, whether you're here in person or if you're on the um, live stream, uh, is that leaders set the tone of trust for the team. And as an engineering manager, I work for, for GitHub, I'm the inch manager responsible for GitHub sponsors, I know that I often have to do a lot of things to set my engineers up to be successful. There is, it's making sure they, they have powerful enough machines to run the local dev environment. It's making sure that they have access to the different software that we use. We use GitHub to build GitHub, and so it's a lot of GitHub tooling. It's also making sure that our CICD pipelines run well. But one underappreciated aspect of what makes engineering teams run well is trust. And I really want you to understand that trust is a key thing to have in place uh, if you're responsible for any software development. Uh, how many managers do I have in the house? Raise your hand. All right, quite a few. So I'm, I'm a manager. A lot of this is about management and leadership, but I also want everyone to know that even if you're not a manager, you are a leader at your company. Uh, we all have the opportunity to lend our voices to the things that are happening within our teams. And I know that as a manager, I always appreciate when everyone sees uh, the, the leadership um, principles inside of themselves that they can bring to the team. Now, I really believe that humans can only present the best versions of ourselves when we operate in an environment without, free, without fear. Uh, and I think that trust is a very powerful way to eliminate fear and to let people show up as their best selves at work. There are four powerful and often overlooked ways to build a culture empowered by trust. But before we get to that, let's, let's define trust. I'm a big believer in definition. So if you ask Google to define trust, you'll get this. Form belief in the reliability, truth, ability, or strength of someone or something. I really like that definition. It resonates and useful. Think about where you work, what the, the company that you work for, maybe the department that you're in, the teams that you're on. When you think about your company, how reliable is it? How well does it practice truthfulness? Do people feel that things actually get done? And how can we build these attributes into our teams and also into our culture? Now, I've worked with teams all around the world, and I've realized that there are four critical traits that inspire trust. But before I get into them, I want to give a little bit of a backstory to how I came to realize that these traits are so important. So I was a student at UT Austin, so go Longhorns, hook them horns. Yeah, all right, one's in the house, yay. Uh, hopefully the football team is a bit better uh, <laughs> as we go uh, throughout uh, the football season. And I 
studied engineering. And so back in the day, and so just to date myself, I was an undergraduate student in the 1990s, to give you a sense of how old I am. I'm old, all right? Yeah, one of my colleagues might be here. Uh, you were probably at, you know, the, the Cockrell Center or one of the other uh, engineering buildings on campus. And one of the things that I really loved, and I got this freshman year, uh, was access to a Unix system, right? And I never had access to Unix. And as one does, I began to explore Unix. And so I'm sure many of you had a similar experience. Uh, I used like Pine for Mail. I discovered Vim for the first time, Emacs, um, even the Lynx kind of text web browser. But one of the things that we had as engineering students was free space to build a website. And so, as you would expect, I began to build my personal website. So I set up my HTML files in the right folder, and I thought, all right, I'm done. Let me go to the web and check out my cool website. And so I went to the web to look at my website, and I got like, a, I don't know if it was a 404, but like basically page not found. And I was like, what is this? I, I, I looked at all of my files. They seemed to be in the right place. My index file was properly formatted but I could not see my web page on the public internet. So I talked to the computer lab proctor, and he let me know that, hey, there's something called file permissions. And you have to set the right permissions for your website to be visible. Uh, and so in Unix, and I'm sure that many of you know this, but for those of you who don't, um, you can set permissions uh, at different levels, right? There's the logged in user level, there's the group, and then there's everyone. And so for these three types of users, you can determine if they can read, write, or execute the file. And I had to use a command called uh, change mode, which I used to pronounce schmod, maybe I'm the only one, but it's, it's change mode. I hope I'm not the only one, but I was like 20 years old. Um, so you had to run a, a command to set the proper permission so that my HTML directory was visible. I did that, and then voila, my website was visible and accessible to people outside of my local machine. And I bring this up because just like there are file permissions that make your, your, your web page or your, your files useful, uh, there are also what I call trust permissions that are really powerful to make your teams really useful. And they are these four traits, capability, vulnerability, fallibility, and flexibility. And in the course of this presentation, I'm going to go through all four traits. I'm going to hopefully let you know how you can foster these traits in your teams and also going to give you a sense of like if you go too far, because you can't go too far in each of these and actually get negative outcomes. All right, let's start with capability. Capability gives people permission to be excellent. Now, capability is simply the ability to achieve valuable outcomes. And this is really important because no matter what you do as a manager, if you cannot show capability, then your engineers will not trust you. And I've led inch teams for going on 20 years. I've been a developer for like 25 years. And over and over and over again, the first thing that I know I have to do as an engineering manager is to show that I can help get results. And the two main areas that I work on to get results are around code and career. And I really want to make sure that my teams can immediately see that I'm a force for helping them get code to production. And I'm also a support for their career. That I can understand where they are, whether they're like an early career uh, person or they're like a senior staff engineer. It's really important that I make sure that they understand this. And there are really two major ways that you can help inch teams feel capable. Uh, and that's velocity and customer delight. And velocity, I think, is, has become an overused term in our industry, but it really just means that we can get things out of the way between all the things, all the cruft, and all the things that slow down, we, we typically call this friction, get all the friction out of the way so that the inch teams can take the features that we are set to do and get them done, right? And the way that you can help reduce friction for inch teams include, one, give them capable uh, laptops that are powerful enough to run the local dev environment, like I said before. Um, it's making sure that the requirements are very clear, that they're not building the wrong things. It's making sure that the work is set up in a way so that we don't have two engineers doing the same thing, right? This happens. You may have been there. And so it's very important that we have an environment where people feel that 
that they have the capability to get things out of the way and actually get code done. But then there's what I call uh, the, the light of the customers, right? Um, some of you work on software that maybe people don't see. Maybe you're a back-end PHP engineer. Maybe you uh, work on APIs. Maybe you work on something else that the end users don't see. But even with those back-end processes, there's the lightful. I love a well-documented API. I love seeing documentation for developers to read. Um, and so those things are really important, helping make sure that engineering teams uh, feel uh, empowered. And if you know that you're creating things that people love, that people love using, then that is super, super powerful. And the reason that capability is so important in inch teams is because high performers will not stay in an environment that is below their standards, right? Let me say it again. High performers will not stay in an environment that is below their standards. They won't trust it because can you imagine an athlete? I don't know if you're a, a, a football fan or a basketball fan or a hockey or curling, whatever your sport is, then you know that if there is a high-performing athlete and they have a coach who doesn't really trust that the coach can help that person win, then they're not going to trust the entire team. They're not going to trust the, the um, organization behind that team. So it's extremely important that we have capability in place if we're going to have an environment of trust. If we build an environment where the people in it feel like they're winning, then they will trust that environment. That's why capability is so, so critical. All right. Now, again, I've been an engineer for a long time. I've been an engineering manager for a long time. And I've been brought on to help teams that had lost faith in their capabilities. And I could sense the, the, the lack of trust that those teams had. There was low morale. There was really a lot of questioning about leadership. And I, there were a lot of things that contributed to why that team had lost their way. But they, they didn't feel that they were getting things done. And it's really important that teams feel that they can get things done, right? This team had missed multiple ship dates. Uh, and then they were basically fighting each other. And whenever I come into a team that's struggling like this, one of the first things I try to do is what I call clear the shipping lanes. That means let's get things out of the way. Let's get the things that's tripping up this team out of the way. And what I usually try to do is first, I focus on WIP, right? Work in progress. And I try to make sure that the work that's in progress is clear, that it's very obvious to anyone we typically use, um, and most people use Jira, right, with the project board that is well-defined, that people know what they're doing. But I really think it's important for engineers to have one thing going on at a time. Because if you have multiple things going on, then you have context switching, and your attention is divided, and you usually do things slower by doing them all at once than you would if you did them in serial. And this is counterintuitive, but the human brain has limited ability to focus on one thing, and if you spread your focus across multiple items, you dilute the outcomes that you produce, right? That's just how humans are wired. And so I always try to make sure that we have what's called typically one piece flow, meaning that you work on something and you wait until that's done before you pick up something else, right? That's one technique. Um, and I also um, work with my product manager to make sure that the, that, that the product backlog is, is refined, that it's very clear. Uh, but I also try to make sure that the backlog's not too heavy. I have walked into so many software development teams where the backlog has hundreds of items. I'm sure you've been there. You log into Jira, and the backlog is just backlog items as far as the eye can see. And this is stuff that like, we know the teams will never get to. Uh, these backlog items often don't even match the in-production product. So why do we have these? And so I go through and I work and I partner with my product manager, with my PM, to let's, let's just call all this stuff, right? I mean, I, we can archive it somewhere else. But by doing so, you reduce the cognitive load of having this massive backlog hanging over teams, right? You may not look at the backlog on a regular basis, but the teams know that it's there. And I find that that's an amazing, uh, a simple yet powerful technique for reducing the cognitive load on inch teams, right? So all these things help teams feel more capable, uh, which improves the trust they have in you if you're a manager, but also in the department. All right. Now, you can go too far, right? Toxic excellence 
refers to when you take capability way, way, way too far. Uh, and actually, uh, Dr. Kim Perkins uh, had a great um, way of explaining this. Um, and she said that if we're learning something and we're floundering a little bit, then we can end up being un really unnecessarily hard on ourselves and judging ourselves according to where we stand with others on some made-up scale. And, and to explain, the, 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 I highly recommend that you uh, look into her her work, what she's saying is that you can create a high-performing, highly capable environment where people don't like each other because you can push excellence too far uh, to where people feel that I have to let, I have to make this other person look bad so that I can look good. And uh, I'm from Texas and at Extension when I was there, they had a project at Enron. Uh, when Enron existed. I was not over their financials, by the way. Uh, I was working on uh, one of their CRM systems. And that was a culture that was high performing because for a while Enron was like the darling of Wall Street, for those of you who remember that, that company and how it was run. Uh, but there was so much toxic, toxicity uh, in that company. I mean, you could almost feel it when you walked into the doors. And that was a culture where they took excellence and capability way, way too far. And so you want to make sure that you have excellence in mind for your organization, for your teams, but you want to make sure that people don't forget that they're on the same team, that we're all working together. And this is especially important, um, really being excellent but not going so far, uh, if you're a member of an underrepresented group, whether you're a woman or a person of color or if you're gay or queer or whatever, because we often receive signals from society uh, that we're less than. And so in these toxic environments, that becomes an even heavier burden to bear. All right, let's go to the second permission for high trust, in, uh, high trust. that's vulnerability. Now, vulnerability is when you have a characteristic that most people would be ashamed to admit possessing. Uh, but I have found that exhibiting vulnerability gives the people around you permission to be human. What am I saying? Well, Brene Brown, who I love, she's a Houstonian. Uh, she's brilliant. I'm sure some of you have heard of her. Uh, but she is a vulnerability expert. And she defines vulnerability that way. Uh, it's the feeling we get during times of uncertainty, risk, or emotional exposure. Now, how many of you have that on your resume? Probably not, right? You don't really have like, oh, I was, I, I was uh, uncertain at this point on this project, or uh, I thought that this was too risky. And so we often shy away from being vulnerable because we feel that vulnerability is weakness. And this is exacerbated by social media, which often gives us this illusion of all of our friends having these perfect lives. And so we often want to show that we have perfect lives as well. We want to take pictures on the Grand Canyon and some people actually fall into the Grand Canyon trying to get that perfect selfie, which is horrible. But we are so socialized to show that everything's fine, everything's okay, look how great my life is, that, we're, that we, we lose the ability to show vulnerability. And it's really important as a manager that you show that, hey, I have imperfections. I have things that I'm not going to put on Twitter uh, um, or Mastodon, and Mastodon takes over, or whatever things are coming over with social media. But there are things that I, I want you to know about me because I have found that there's power in vulnerability. And it's really only by pushing vulnerabilities that we've had human advancement, right? We, we broke the sound barrier. Uh, we climbed the highest peaks in the world. We've even set foot on the moon because we recognize vulnerabilities uh, and we work to address them. So how can you practice vulnerability uh, with your teams? So some of you remember a few years ago, uh, there was something called a manager read me. Uh, and this is the file that managers created to show that, hey, this is how I like to receive feedback. This is how I like to receive work. Here are some of the things that will upset me. If you want to make me really happy, happy or if you want to bribe me, then here's how, you know, if you can, you know, slip donuts under my door every Wednesday, right? People would write these files describing basically um, how they operated as managers, very similar to a README file in a repo. And while I do think that these README files can, uh, can be helpful, they, they can also be 
misuse. And I think that sometimes some managers use these files as like, here, read my manager, read me, and then never talk to me again because it's all there. Like, that's not the purpose of a manager read me. It's really meant to start conversations, not end conversations. So at GitHub, we have what, what we call, we, we don't call them manager read me's. Uh, we call them human user guys or, or hugs, right? H-U-G's. And so uh, we have a repo where we have our, our human, um, our uh, HUGs in. And so uh, here's a copy of mine. And it's really, really small, so I don't expect you to read it, but this is a screenshot of my, um, of my human user guide at GitHub. I committed this to this repo probably my third day at work. Um, and it just tells about myself. It tells about you know, how I like to, to operate, how I like to work. But I, I got really vulnerable uh, in my human user guide. And again, I don't expect you to be able to uh, see this, um, but I admitted that I actually have a stutter. I have a childhood stutter that I've had over the years, and I've worked on it, uh, and that this is something that sometimes I, if I'm stressed or if I haven't got enough sleep or if I just don't feel comfortable, uh, that I can just totally be stopped or bluffed with my speech. Um, and so I... I documented this in my human user guide. If you go to my website, it's there as well. And I did that because of what I've done to overcome that, right? I mean, one thing that I've done is throw myself in situations of hundreds of people where I have to talk because I did not want my speech impediment to hamper my voice. And I have never had a situation where I've divulged this vulnerability where someone has not come up, maybe not that day, but usually within the first few weeks, when they say, hey, I too have something to share with you. I have a vulnerability as well. And I found that vulnerability begets vulnerability. That when you lower your guard and allow yourself to be human, people do the same. And people trust environments that allow them to become human, to be human, to, to walk in humanity, that we all share. And I think we all have read accounts, especially recently in the news of high power people uh, stripping away the humanity of the people that they're responsible for. And this is the opposite of that, right? We're recognizing that every human deserves dignity and respect. And in all of our flaws and all of our strengths that we can still work together to do great things. And I really think that's really important. Now, again, you can go too far with vulnerability and go into what I call therapy at work, right? Some people, and this is often leaders who have a lot of power, um, really, they try to be vulnerable, but they're really trying to get free therapy at work. And that, that, that's not what I mean. Um, I really don't like when people with big titles lay all their foibles and all their problems on the people that they work with, really to garner sympathy and often to cover bad behavior, uh, because like, that's not fair to the people who you lead. I'm looking for authentic vulnerability. I'm looking for Brene Brown vulnerability. I'm looking for people who are willing to say, I'm here to just share my humanity with all of you. All right? All right. The third key permission for trust is fallibility. And that gives people permission to make mistakes. Now, fallibility is just simple, right? It's the ability to make errors. We all know that, you know, being fallible, right? What's the term to, um, to be, to urge to be human, but to forgive is divine, something like that, right? Humans, we make mistakes. And what I really want the managers in here to understand, because when I started out, my, my first inch team that I led was probably back in 2001, 2002, like a long time ago. Um, I thought I had to be the best engineer. I had to be the person who caught mistakes, not the person who admitted to mistakes. Uh, and so early on, I was not good at this because I thought that <clears throat> excuse me, being the leader meant that I was the best. But I've learned that actually being the leader doesn't mean that you're the best. But you're not, not that, that being a leader doesn't mean that you're the best at writing code, but you're the best at leading coders. <clears throat> and a powerful technique for leading coders is letting them know that mistakes happen. They're going to happen. It's okay. Um, we are writing this, you know, obscure language that's meant to be uh, either compiled or interpreted by machines to actually make useful stuff, right? Mistakes are going to happen along the way. That's just how it works. And if you just cop to that, if you just admit that, then you, you, you take off the pressure that people often feel work in this field. I mean, there's nothing more terrifying than working for a manager that you're just, just, 
you're, you just feel sick thinking that they're going to find out that I did something wrong because I've had managers that were brutal in punishing even the smallest mistake because they think that that's helping people get better. Uh, but like working in a position of fear does not allow you to do your best work. And a key part of psychological safety, and that's a term that's been thrown around, is knowing that, hey, it's okay to make mistakes. And as a leader, I found that some of the best growth happens in the aftermath of a big mistake. Uh, Susan Gell Levine um, is a businesswoman, a diplomat, who is ambassador to Switzerland and Liechtenstein. Any Liechtensteiners in the house? No? Any Swiss people in the house, people from, from, from Switzerland? All right, we're all from other parts of the world. That's fine. Um, but I like how she framed failure, right? Uh, she said, failure is just another word for growing. And it's only failure if you don't get back up. And as an interesting manager, like one of the things that I really try to do, and, and again, I, I and managers know this, right? You see all the failure, right? Because you're, not the, you're actually not doing any work, right? You're rarely writing code if you're a manager. Some some managers and some uh, companies write code maybe part-time, but a lot of us, right, we're not writing code anymore. So that means that you observe a lot of code. You might see things in pull requests, or you might see things make it to production that have to be uh, backed out, right? Um, so we, we, we are primed to see mistakes. Um, and it's really important that you don't hold mistakes over your teams, but that you use them as learning opportunities. Because if you do that, then people have trust that it's okay to be human. It's okay to make mistakes. Um, and one of the first things that I tell my teams when I join a new team is, is just that. Look, I'm going to make mistakes. Some of them are going to be, well, hopefully most of them are going to be really small, uh, but there's going to be a few big ones. And so as the manager, when I, when I admit to being capable of being fallible, then that takes the pressure off the people who I'm managing. And it's really important that we do that because, again, mistakes are fertile, are fertile ground for learning and growth. And, and again, I, I, I want to make sure that we always tie the lesson to the mistake, right? That we, that we learn from the failure. Um, and I've been through this, right? There have been times when I have not clearly communicated things like deadlines. And the teams were working on things, and then as we got closer to the deadline, they were like, what deadline? I'm like, that deadline. And they're like, what, what are you talking about? Um, and I had to own up that I was the one who did not clearly communicate. No, this deadline is a hard deadline, right? There's other teams that are depending on us. Um, and, and by admitting my, admitting my mistake uh, and being clear that I did not manage their expectations, then we were able to improve communication. We were able to improve how we work together. And that was powerful, right? And so some of the best growth between uh, the, you know, myself as a manager and the direction I'm responsible for has been when we've made even big mistakes that we learned from and that we grew. Uh, those of you that, who do uh, retros, um, you, you probably see this, right? If you do a retrospective, maybe that's, you know, once a week or twice um, a month or whatever. Uh, and I highly encourage sprint retros or retros period, uh, even if you're not doing sprints, as a way to interrogate your teams and learn from those mistakes. Don't hide those mistakes and learn from them because I think it's really, really powerful. Now, you can go too far in this permission as well uh, in glorifying and making mistakes, right? Because that makes, that makes you the uh, company child. And you don't want to be the company child who's always running around talking about, oh, I, woe is me, um, I made this mistake because you don't want to undermine your own competence. It's really important that you have a high standard for how you operate, but that you also acknowledge that, hey, mistakes will happen. All right, the fourth and final permission is flexibility. And flexibility gives people permission to make choices, right? It's the ability to choose from a variety of options in order to come up with a solution. And uh, Patty McCord, who was one of the people who helped form the bones of Netflix, um, in her book, Powerful, Building a Culture of Freedoms and Re Re um, Responsibility, <clears throat> excuse me, said, um, a company's job isn't to empower people. It's to remind people that they walk in the door with power and to create the conditions for them to exercise it. Do that and you will be astonished by the great work they will do for you. And I love this quote because so many times, and I've said this, that, oh, I'm an engineering manager. I want to empower my teams. 
Uh, and this quote shows that, no, your teams already have power. When you hire them, you hire them probably for their power, right? Their power as an engineer or their power as a designer or as a product manager, whatever. Um, they have power when they came into your companies. What you need to do is to create an environment where they can walk in their power. And so this comes down to trust. And as a manager, I have to trust my people to use their power to generate powerful outcomes. And I think that that will, that will result in them becoming more trusting of the company. And again, I, I love how Patty said that as a manager, as a leader, uh, it's my job to create the conditions for people to exercise their power. And one thing I do, I'm responsible for GitHub sponsors, is that I always try to make sure that I'm very clear on outcomes. Like, these are the outcomes that I'm looking for. You have complete freedom in how you get to those outcomes. And by, and by, by doing that, giving them their autonomy and how to get those results, I've been amazed that they got things done. Like, I never, these are I never saw coming, right? Ways that I never thought of how to solve that future request, how to solve that bug, often come when I don't try to be prescriptive in how my teams should, uh, do their work. I try to be clear in the outcome and give them freedom of, in, in doing that. And, and one thing I do as a manager uh, is try to make sure that the work is very visible, right? Um, I have information radiators. You, that's the agile term, right? And whether, you, again, you do agile or not, being very clear in where the work is, and again, we don't use Jira at GitHub, we use um, GitHub issues, where we have a board of where the work is, whether it's not started, whether it's in progress or in review or done, right? Very simple lanes that we do so that it's really easy to see where the work is. And again, it's really important that as a manager, I'm talking to the managers in the house, that we do our best to try to remove the friction from our teams. So many teams are stifled by managers because, you know, we want to show that we're doing our work and we want to have processes in place and we want to have these things that we show that, hey, we're managing the work and it's under control and it's being, uh, you know, we're mitigating risk and all these things. And all those things are good, but they can often slow down teams. And I really have found that the biggest gift I can give to my teams is reducing friction as much as possible. And, you know, I also have to be flexible in my management style. Um, a few years ago, I had a team that was mostly senior engineers and a couple of people uh, that are, you know, kind of, I think we call them E3s, which is like right below seniors. We also had a staff engineer. Um, and I'm a very structured engineering manager, right? I have like a structure for my one-on-ones, a structure for how I do performance management, a structure for everything. And so I started working with the staff engineer when I joined this team. And I have a very straight set of questions that I typically ask on the first one-on-one and the second one-on-one. And it's all meant to make sure that I understand, you know, who they are, what they're looking for. Hey, are you looking to get promoted to principal engineer or, or you know, what's going on with your career? Um, and this person went to my manager and said that, oh, N1 is making me scared in my one-on-ones. <laughs> and so uh, my, my, my manager, who was the director of the department, kind of let me know, that, hey, you know, this, this person is really struggling with how you do one-on-ones. And why don't you just let one-on-ones be just, just free-for-alls and just conversations, right? Um, and so I began to do that, right? I had to flex my style because this person saw one-on-ones not as a way to get kind of career advice or a way to update, you know, project work, but just to talk about whatever's on their mind. And so my one-on-ones with this staff engineer uh, just became vent sessions where they talked about what was on their mind. It was very stream of consciousness. And I'm, again, I'm very structured, so I'm not comfortable with just random talking because <laughs> I'm trying to get things done. Uh, but my relationship with the staff engineer got so much better because I was flexible. And she began to trust me more because she began to see that if I bring an issue up, and yeah, she went to my manager, which was fine, uh, but that I will respond to it well, I won't bring any ego to the conversation, and I'll be flexible. Uh, and we ended up having a great relationship after that, right? So flexibility really is a key part of building trust. Again, you can go too far, right? We don't want to go into an anything goes culture, 
right? You can be overly flexible where people feel that they can do anything. I'm not saying that. I really think that we need to balance the freedom and the flexibility to get outcomes with the minimum viable structure that engineers need, right? Engineers do need some structure. And most engineers that I've worked with like structure, right? We like writing well, um, well-written pull requests, right? We like having someone look at our code and review it, right? We like having, um, you know, great unit tests, right? Those are all the little tiny disciplines of, of doing engineering that you really need to have it in place, right? So you need to have those in place, but outside of those, it's really important that we give people freedom and flexibility to come up with creative solutions because, after all, that's what we're paying them for. So I, I, I really believe that if you want to build an environment where teams believe in the companies that they work for, that they believe that their companies are truthful, uh, and we've seen lots of companies where the leaders aren't being truthful, um, that we have teams that believe in the capabilities and the strength of the organizations that employ them, then I really believe that these four permissions are extremely, extremely powerful in building that type of company. Now, I have a few more minutes left before I close because I want to go over some frequently asked questions that I often get uh, after this talk. Um, and so one is, uh, what do I do if I have broken trust? And I've been there. I mean, I've broken trust before. Um, it's always embarrassing. It's thankfully rare in my career. But it's really important that you acknowledge that you have broken trust. And I like to use the kind of STAR framework, right? Situation, task, action, result. And have an honest conversation with the person that you broke trust with and say, hey, this was the situation. We were trying to do this. I had to make a quick decision. So that was my task. Uh, was to make a quick call on something, and I took this action, uh, and the result was that while I was successful in what I needed to do, you got hurt along the way, right? So the star framework is a great way to simply acknowledge that you broke trust. And you can explain that, hey, look, my intention was not to have you get hurt, but I take responsibility for the fact that you were hurt. And here's what I'm going to do to make sure that it doesn't happen again. And it's really important that after you do that, that you take the time to over-communicate, right? So the first few weeks after you break trust, you have to say, hey, I'm doing this because I wanna make sure that that doesn't happen again. Because that person needs to see that you are following through on what you committed to do to make sure that you don't break their trust again, right? So the STAR framework is a really great, it's a great tool for many things, but especially when you've broken trust. All right, what do I do if I don't trust my leadership team? Ah, that's a tough one. Um, I've been lucky to work at companies where I had a large degree of trust in my leadership team. And so I have not run into this a lot in my, uh, in my um, time working in software. But it, it's really important that if you don't trust your leadership team, that you, one, find peers to talk to, right? Find peers if you're a manager, find fellow managers, or if you have a, a coach or a mentor outside of your company, and, and say, hey, you know, here's what I'm observing, right? Because you always want to make sure that you're not missing something, and then you can say, this is what happened, this is the outcome, and this seemed to be like not a very trustful thing that they did, that this is making me feel that these leaders are being trustworthy. Uh, and, and I will say often they will agree with you. Um, and it's very important to have someone to one, vet the feelings that you're having about the trustworthiness of the people in leadership. Uh, but then I would say that as a manager, sometimes what your role is, if, there, if you're in an environment of low trust in the top of the company, then what you can do is cultivate what I call a trust bubble with you and your reports. And while you won't be able to totally blunt the lack of trust at the top of the company, you can do a lot to help make sure that the people that you're responsible for feel trust, that they're in a trust environment, at least under your span of, span of, span of control uh, and under your remit. Uh, and so I've done that before, where there was some shakiness, where kind of leadership changed, and I made sure that I was doing my best to create a high trust environment. 
All right. Well, thank you so much. That's my time. Um, then you see a picture of me. You see my Twitter ID. But you also see my wife who uh, was going to come with me to Minnesota because we're doing a workshop on burnout on Thursday. Uh, she couldn't make it, but I wanted to have her here. So if you're going to be in the burnout resistance workshop, um, you, you have to do with me in person. Uh, but she will join via WebEx and she'll do her part of the workshop virtually. So if you're going to be uh, here on Thursday uh, at my workshop, uh, then I'm happy to talk with you um, well, about burnout, uh, but also talk to you about trust and how you can also build a culture of trust within your companies. And I will be rooting for all of you as you help your teams unlock the permission systems for a culture of high trust. Thank you.